So I'm really, really happy to be here for two reasons. First, because I love to speak to developers. I used to be a developer myself many, many years ago. I started out um, as an engineer and a software developer at GT Laboratories, which is uh, now part of Verizon. Back in the day when there were corporate laboratories that, that um, did basic research, and um, actually I worked on search. We didn't call it search back then because there was no internet. Uh, it was called internet information retrieval. And it was, uh, it was sort of an offshoot of database uh, research. And, um, and so I love talking to developers. I love because I feel that you, the younger generation, are going through what I went through. And I, I had a lot of questions when I was young about how the world works. Um, and there weren't many, many answers. And I hope maybe at least I can ask some more good questions. Uh, the second reason I'm happy is because I'm being given an hour and a half. Uh, and usually I only get 20 minutes or maybe at most 40 minutes. And uh, I, I, I don't get a chance to really dwell on some of the data and some of the richness of, of information that, that can be put on the screen. And the, um, the screens we have today are tremendous. Uh, if you think about how many pixels we have available to show information with, and how many pixels we have to give great rich detail, but it's detail that's often unfilled, especially in a PowerPoint culture. So let's see how far we can push the pixels on this screen. I'll be presenting using an iPad, which has a retina display and actually has more pixels than the, than, than the projector, typically. Uh, but let's, uh, let's see what we can get. Now, broadly speaking, I think the question we all have is, what is the future going to be like? What is the future of certain technologies? Um, I know this was my job for eight years. I had to figure out what would be the future of something called smartphones. And at the time, back in 2003, 2004, that meant either Microsoft or Symbian. So there were a lot of debates about who would win that fight. Um, and we were looking at horizons. We were looking at four or five year horizons m at most, but uh, not very accurate even in two years, as it turns out. So um, what I thought about a lot is what is the correct time horizon for understanding technologies? And so I decided to look a little bit further than usual. I decided to look at technologies starting in 1900. And I decided to think about a century's worth of technology evolution. So this type of graph actually shows penetration, as you see there on the scale, uh, on the, on the y-axis title, uh, but in, in a way, in the ratio, penetration over non-penetration. And that yields a, um, a figure between, in this case, 0.1 and 10, representing approximately 9% to 90%. So that is the range we're going to be exp uh, uh, exposing. And uh, the, the adoption of technologies are on the basis of consumer users as users, consumer technology and the United States. Not so much the world because we don't have this richness of detail. So let's start. Oh, and in the corner here, you're going to see as it moves on the technology being illustrated. And and the first is the stove, the, what some call the range. This is the turn on um, uh, and heat your food type product. And in 1900, this was an emerging technology. Um, it just crossed over 9 to 10% penetration of US households. And by 1938, it, it was at 50%. At and it took until about 1957 for it to reach uh, what we think of saturation around 90%. Now, note how nice and smooth this line is, or relatively smooth, um, 
it is actually uh, an S curve, but because of the transform we put it through, it looks more like a line. And by the way, this is a log scale, so that's why you get the line. Um, but that's, that's the way to think, and this is, the, the, this is the, the prototype for all the technologies I'm going to try to explore. And I'm going to introduce each technology at, uh, in a chronological order as it entered the marketplace, in this case, uh, defined as 10% market share or, or uh, penetration. So um, let me go to the next uh, technology. Uh, this is the telephone. Uh, the notice it's different. It's got a kink in it. It uh, suffered from a, a decline in usage, and it, it suffered that in uh, starting in 1929, which, uh, as we know, is is the beginning of the depression, the Great Depression. Uh, but it came back, and in fact, during the war years of 1941 to 1945, it actually started growing again and re uh, recovered its trajectory. And it, in fact, it reached saturation about 1970. And that's how long it took for telephones to become popular and or ubiquitous in the United States. 1968 happens to be the year I was born. I wasn't born in America. I was born in Romania. But uh, this is uh, roughly uh, what was going on there um, uh, here now at that time. So next, next one is electricity. Interesting to see contrast, electricity versus uh, telephony. Uh, both are network technologies depending on infrastructure, depending on a lot of right of ways, depending on a lot of capital ex expenditure. In fact, electricity requires typically more, and yet it has a much steeper rise. One of the reasons I'm told this happened was because actually the government was very deeply involved in the um, the acceleration of adoption of, of electricity. Electrification was a national priority rather than a commercial priority, and telephony was not seen as strategic. It too suffered a slight decline in the depression period or a plateau, but then it picked up again. But it has one of the most smooth and, and continuous lines uh, on the graph. So let's see what else we have. We have the automobile. The automobile began around 1915 in terms of reaching 10% penetration, but we know it wasn't invented then. In fact, this is a good time to think about how long it takes for a technology to even reach 10% penetration. The automobile was invented, uh, defined as a patented invention in uh, 1886. So that was in Germany, uh, but it took uh, quite a few decades for it to reach 10% penetration, and once it did, it actually took off very rapidly, and that's the Ford Model T enabling it through um, the production system that Ford pioneered. It is not just mass assembly, but it was a specific kind of mass assembly that is actually the foundation of the industry to this day. However, it too was not immune to the, uh, to, to, to the depression. Um, there, there was a decline right around 1930, and uh, in fact, it, it stayed down during the war years because resources were diverted away from uh, manufacturing engines and bodies which required steel and um, a lot of uh, capacity in factories which was allocated to war production. So it didn't take off again until after the war and interestingly it didn't quite reach 100 percent until about 1990. So that's a very important technology that was influential uh, to society. In contrast, you have the radio, which came out very soon after, around 1920, and it went straight up. It too is a network technology, but it's a wireless technology. It's the first wireless technology for consumers. And it had an ecosystem, and that was radio programming. It required radio network uh, the, the creation of radio networks that required new businesses, business models, and how to commercialize, how to make money from this new technology. It too was invented much earlier, and, but the, once, it was, uh, once a business model was well understood, it took off very rapidly. And we know from history how rich the culture of radio was around that time when in fact we had the breakthrough of the H.G. Wells, uh, the story of um, uh, um, 
what's the name of the, the War of the Worlds, which actually frightened people to thinking that we were being invaded by aliens. It was, it was that time when it happened. And other labor-saving devices, for example, the washer, it has a rather slow slope. It also has the kink and the dip in, in, the, in the war years due to resource issues. It also doesn't quite reach all the way to the top. In fact, I'll take it all the way till the present, and it still hasn't reached 100%. And here, there's nothing wrong with the washer. It's a very commodity product. The difference is that it doesn't fit in everyone's life. There are some people who live in apartments who have no room for washers or dryers and the hookups and everything needed, and so they simply saturated it around 80% or so. And uh, the, so that, uh, they began in the 1930s as well. So then, um, now in contrast, we have refrigerators which are also, I consider, labor-saving devices because they, they saved us from walking to the store every day. They saved us also from getting sick uh, from, from food poisoning and allowed us to actually eat a better variety of fresh foods. And so this was a killer product, a very, very popular viral hit. Um, the, the refrigerator grew as fast as the radio, even though it wasn't a very cheap appliance. Similarly to the radio, the television, and television began after the war, now we're in the late 40s. It was invented before the war, but again due to circumstances beyond its control, it could not enter the market until the late 40s, and what, but once it did, it went straight up. And it solved the same job approximately as the radio, which was avoid boredom, avoid the pain and suffering of not having anything to do. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's a job we have today, even now. And yet there it is, vertical growth. Again, if you think about the golden era of television, it's about smack in the middle of that curve, right? The great shows, the great innovation that took place in entertainment, in terms of commercialization, in terms of commercials themselves, in terms of advertising, Mad Men, all the things that came out of that era were because of this type of product. So that's television, late 1940s came again, the dryer, the dryer actually interesting, it took a bit longer than the washing machine. Apparently it wasn't that important to have a dryer. It consumed a lot of energy compared to uh, air drying and people felt that air drying was good enough for a long, long time and they still, many people still do in the world. Uh, and so even the dryer to this day, it reached about equal level to the washing machine, but it was offset somewhat. So that's in the 1950s, uh, air conditioning, if you go back to even the late, mid-1970s, air conditioning was not in 50% of homes. It was a luxury product for most of the, the century. Um, finally, dishwasher. Dishwasher also similar to the washing machine. It wasn't very, very popular because it required um, a certain uh, configuration for the home and older homes couldn't support it. And to this day, it's not the most, uh, it's not saturated in that sense. Then came an, another, another rev revision of the TV, the color TV. The color TV, uh, same slope, very vertical. Uh, it took only a couple of years to reach uh, saturation. And by the, by the early 1980s, it was in every home. And then more, now we're thinking more about, about the 1980s. And what was the killer technology in the 1980s was the microwave. Uh, it is the successor to the stove, although it did not displace it. Many people thought it would, but in fact it was complementary to the stove and they coexist rather well. And microwaves are, in my opinion, another ecosystem technology where it required not only, the first, the first instance was that it would be used for heating, reheating food, but in fact now they're microwave ready, ready meals which are designed for the product directly, so there's a whole uh, even to this day, evolution of, of the type of product that fits this, pro this technology uh, and also dishes and other things that are microwave safe. But the microwave, ve very quickly, it sort of plateaued a bit but uh, continued and saturated. But okay, 1980s, we have another entertainment technology, the VCR came. It was, again, like every entertainment technology, nearly vertical. But 
we had a problem with the VCR, right? Um, and that was that it was very quickly replaced by the DVD, so its actual lifespan was fairly limited. Of course, color TVs displace black and white, and that's not shown in any sort of a decline in the black and white TV, but, but uh, it did happen in the same way. And finally, we come to what we think of as high technology, personal computing. It only started in the early 1980s. Actually, it started in the 1970s, I should say that 10% of the market was penetrated by early 1980s. In fact, the celebration of the max 30th anniversary was in 1984. That's exactly, the Mac launched when the US had 10% penetration. It was quite a long time from the original Apple II, it was quite a long time from the original um, uh, TRS-80 or Commodore 64 or other systems that had existed, but it was um, at that in the mind of the consumer, it was still early days. But the other thing to note about the PC is that it, um, seems to have peaked already. Um, that's the data I have, it doesn't go beyond 2011, but the, the problem is that we know that sales have started to decline already uh, for quite a few quarters, and penetration may be starting to come down. And it is among the few technologies on this list that you've just seen that did not reach 100%. And we know the answers as to why some of those didn't, like the washer, the dryer, and the dishwashing machine. But why wouldn't the PC reach 100%? And it had plenty of time. It is by no means the steepest slope here, right? It took a long time to reach this point of non-saturation. And we can certainly contrast it with other technologies for the home. Now this is a controversial one. Video game consoles. Video game consoles are about 50%, maybe a little bit more, this data is a bit old. But this is a fragment of the data and the reason is that this is only seventh generation. There are seven generations, or six generations before this one. And the first came out in the 1970s. So we don't know what the shape of the curve is before then, but we know the origin. And look how many decades it took to get this far. It's actually shocking to me that video games haven't saturated it. They're actually performing worse than the PC, and the PC is pretty poor. There's something wrong with the job to be done. As I said, the things that go vertical means that they're really killing it. They know exactly what the customer wants this one seems to have failed. And we could argue, well, just give it another 30 years. But we know what happens. Uh, this is what happens. This is the cell phone. The cell phone uh, actually only kicked off in the early 1990s. Some of you may have owned one back then. Uh, I know I did. Uh, and, and, and they reached saturation in the United States already by 2006. Now this is not the smartphone, this is this regular cell phone, right? This is your, your uh, average flip phone, something like a, maybe a Razor. Does anybody remember the Razor? Um, yeah, so that took, uh, that took the world by storm and, and it sustained this trajectory uh, for, for, you know, pretty much the steepest slope we've seen so far. And by the way, this is true globally. Uh, just a moment to let me explain that. If you were to do the same story about any other country, I think they would look very similar. The only difference might be that they're going to get shifted. The slopes tend to be the same in these types of graphs for the same technology. It's just that typically people uh, will, will begin uh, picking it up later in different countries. And that's the cell phone. Now let's step forward. The internet. It started after the cell phone. It started mostly, in, in, again, in, in the early 90s. And by the time of Internet Explorer and, um, and some of the, you know, uh, Windows, Windows 95 obviously was just here, right? This is, Windows 95 is what, what really kicked it off probably. Uh, but of course it needed much more than that. It needed 
the cabling and all the other uh, innovations in terms of bandwidth that were necessary for ISPs. This was a huge controversy in the 90s, who would own the last mile, who would own the fiber, who would own access to consumers. It's no longer a topic of discussion, but it was a bi big multi-billion dollar debate. But the internet hasn't reached the peak yet. In fact, it's, it's about uh, 80 and 90 percent, oh sorry, eight, about 80 percent in the United States. It's pretty shocking that it hasn't saturated yet. So uh, this is to be watched. I don't think it's going to come down like the PC did. I think it's going to sustain through the fact that, of course, we have uh, uh, mobile technologies. Before we get to that, though, right in the middle of all that, can yet another television technology. After the color TV came HDTV, and HDTV looks very much vertical like every, every other TV format. And here it is kind of projecting it a little bit into 2014. And finally, it's getting tight here at the, end of the, at the end of the graph here, we have the smartphone. The smartphone is pretty much very predictable, another straight line. The smartphone, in fact, um, we have data on it from Comscore. We can track on a monthly basis nowadays. And because it's so predictable, we, we can, I'm comfortable projecting it to be at this level in 2014. And last but not least is uh, the tablet, uh, which is following right behind the smartphone on the parallel trajectory. It's at around 40% of the US today. So this is the story of a century of technology. Very much the pattern is these vertical or s sloping lines. And here they are all together. In fact, the way to look at this graph is as I, as I go, as I, as I pull this, this, this slider, you'll see how whenever a technology pops off the top of the stack, uh, it means it has reached saturation. So you can see how it was the radio that actually won that race, if you will. The, in, in the previous slides, I was showing the, 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 the birth. Here we're showing sort of the the, the, the end, end, of, end of maturity, um, radio, electricity, 1950s, refrigerator, then the stove, then the TV, then the, the telephone, then actually color TV overtaking the car, then the car, then actually microwaves holding uh, anybody. Oh, cell phone actually beat them all. But that's, that's an, a fun game. You can do it multiple ways. You can also start to look at this and kind of stare at it and say, oh, I see there's sort of a pattern. There's some which are straight lines, which are very vertical. There's some which are slower. Maybe we can categorize these technologies in terms of those which have a killer job to be done and some of those maybe which are either not nailing it or are dependent on some infrastructure issues. There's, there's, by the way, there's a lot of these things that people think that there's a dependency. Like I said, the internet was thought to depend upon the goodwill of government or the goodwill of cable operators or somebody who's standing in the way who, if only they would move faster. Well, it turns out that, you know, internet is catching on globally no matter what the government is saying. We're seeing some technologies are, are simply, the speed limits are not driven so much by gatekeepers but by simple economics. But I'm not so much really going to dwell on the who's better than who or which is better than what. Instead, I want to step even further away and look at this in a different way. I'm going to actually take this illustration and actually add texture to it, add a little bit more detail. And the way I did that is by actually showing uh, for each uh, year a vertical line here. And this is the actual scale, which is a little bit confusing, but I know you guys are smart enough to figure it out. Uh, this is the relationship between p and 1 over uh, 1 minus p. Uh, the fact that it's logarithmic is, is shown as well. And here it is all together in one big picture. And, and that way sort of we can kind of figuratively squint and see it all together like this. Now, as I said, there's patterns to be seen. But the, the point of this illustration is to add another layer to it to come in slowly. And it is to show this lifespans of the people who lived throughout this century. So draw your attention to the upper corner here where I'm pointing out that each, 
Each line, each of these green lines, these green segments, represents the lifespan of an individual born in that year. So you see the year of birth and the life expectancy of a person born in 1900. So you just need to look down and say, okay, 1900 person uh, lived until approximately, or is expected to live until 1946. So, uh, okay, this was, by the way, this is a couple of caveats. Number one, this is a blend of male and female average. Uh, number two, uh, this is life expectancy at birth. If you live at a certain age, you might actually see that line grow longer. But this is, the, this is easy to obtain data. The history of life expectancy at birth for the United States overlaid on the technology curves. Now, a couple of things to note again. Notice how jagged it is. Um, how there's a big dip here. See that dip there? Uh, that's 1918. Anybody know why it dipped in 1918? It was the flu that killed millions worldwide. This is what, what the, the, I think is one of the greatest tragedies and one of the greatest fears we should have today. But the other thing in terms of hope is that the reason the line is so ragged, by the way, is because of other viruses and other pathogens and bacteria in particular. And it's smoothed out as some of those uh, vaccines and antibiotics came into use. And as not only did it smooth out, but it got longer. And we have healthcare to thank for, which is not one of these lines on this graph. It's a very important technology and a very important science. It doesn't get enough credit. But I'd like to also draw attention to one particular segment in this graph, and it's this one, which is the colors on it, and it's actually my life. Uh, born in 1968, as I, as I already mentioned. And I color-coded it by uh, phases of life. So this would be childhood. In blue, this is, this is my, uh, my teenage years. This is college. And this is working life in orange. And um, it ends, the graph ends in today and I'm still alive. So, so we, we, we can now step back. And the reason I put myself on here is because I wanted to test the validity of these graphs. I wanted to know if the data that was being published about the, these, these curves was accurate. Did I or my family uh, enjoy a dishwasher within the, the, within the span of its growth? Now, the way to understand it, you, one, if the line is very vertical, it means you would have when it intersects your, your line, which I assume you guys are all somewhere here, given your <laughs> youth. Um, but whatever intersects your, your life is something that you have to think, did I buy it around the beginning or the end of that cycle, meaning am I an early adopter or a late adopter? In some cases, if something is very, very shallow, you know, early adoption of the dishwasher would mean I bought it in this time frame. Um, you know, if I'm, I'm a late adopter, I would buy it in this time frame, all right? So it's not perfect to sort of say that, did I buy a cell phone in 1997? It could have been before or after, but it's an approximation, and you can go through this. And, you know, you, you know we, we thought of sort of figuratively putting, everybody putting their, their, their strip on this, on this board and, and, and measuring their life with it in terms of these, these lines. But the other thing that's interesting about this is, sorry, is that um, we can zoom out a bit. And we can zoom out, because, why, why do we want to do that? Is because firstly, like I said, I'm not dead yet. And I am curious about what's going to happen through the rest of my life. So uh, worrying about the next year isn't as interesting to me as worrying what's going to happen around 2038. I'll still be around, hopefully. In fact, uh, a bit depressing to look at it this way, isn't it? To think that you, you have an expectancy to sort of exit at a certain time. But anyway, there it is. That's, that's, that's the data. Um, <laughs> but notice another, another weird thing is that, you know, about a third of this graph is empty of lines. 
And in just a moment, as, you know, it's not so much that, why did I not stop here? Because I should not be concerned about anything beyond my life. Well, I am concerned because actually I have a son and my son was born in 2005. And actually this graph only begins, I mean, it terminates in, in the end of life expectancy of someone born in 1998. So, so in a person born in 1998 is expected to live until 2074. A person born in 2005 hopefully will be quite a bit further than that. Actually, seven years, but hopefully even longer if life expectancy increases. So I care about what's going to happen even beyond the end of my life because I care about what's going to happen to the life of my son. And I also care what happened back here because actually my grandmother was born in 1913 and she told me what, what life was like at that time, so nearly the beginning of the century. And see, she certainly knew people who were alive in the, and born in the, in the 19th century. So as far as the, anal the analytical framework for me and my family, this is the minimum scope. It's 174 years. So that was the question I was starting with. What is the right framework for analyzing a technology? For me, it's 174 years. You know, you may quibble with that. But the other thing to ask when you look at it this way, is exactly what's going to happen in the blank areas, or the blank area. And when I, you know, when I think about this, uh, one of the things is that I know who doesn't know the answer. I know that Wall Street doesn't know the answer. And how do I know that? Is because they didn't know the answer five years ago about what's happening today. They certainly, if you go back to the 1970s or 80s or 90s and ask well, who did they bet their money on, most of those companies are gone. And they really didn't have the ability to allocate resources in the economy in such a way that they would enable these growth curves to exist. They put money on what was around back then, not on what was going to emerge. In fact, the way to think about it is almost every one of these lines was unforeseeable. It was unforeseen by the stock market, but the stock market, let's not pick on them. They're the reflection of the thoughts of millions of people. They're not fools. They just can't really figure out all these millions of people and all the politicians in the world could not have foreseen the tablet or its effect. So maybe, in fact, if we extrapolate from the fact that the market is a reflection on society, maybe nobody knows what's going to happen. And maybe even we can step that far to say that ex nobody knows what's going to be on this, uh, on, on this canvas. And then I thought, could it be that there will be no lines at all? Now. We know there were a rich history of lines, and we have a century of them. But if we go before that century, there weren't many. In the 19th century, there were mostly technologies for industry. There were technologies for transportation, like the railroads, steam engines, ships, innovation around steel making. But these were not consumer technologies. They were very, very few. There were no labor-saving devices so much uh, as we see them today. So it was, it was in fact the earliest technologies, the fact that we had stoves and electricity and radio that allowed, of the, allowed a lot of the later technologies to develop. In fact, what's untold here is how every technology actually depended upon others before it. And that every technology stood on its shoulders. You couldn't get productivity improvements in telecommunications and all these other things unless you had roads and trains and infrastructure like electricity available. And so maybe one way to think about what the, what the road ahead is, is by asking what could be built upon the foundations we have today. And I believe that as the, in fact you can study that, the, 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 the smartphone needed the cell network, the smartphone needed the internet, the smartphone needed the personal computer to exist. It was a miniature version of that, in fact. 
And again, you, you follow that, that chain of causality and you go all the way back to the beginning of the century. So in fact, I've sort of answered my own question. If these technologies actually can be used as building blocks for further development of technology, then yes, we will have more lines. And you can make that projection. And I'll leave it to you to draw these lines. But I want to step away from that just a little bit. And I want to tell you how an there's another way to think about the data. And, and this is um, the same information shown as, as these lines where for each technology I give a, 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 a bar and there you see for example although it's unlabeled the first one is the uh, the stove born in 1900 lasting 58 years through this period of superb growth and thereafter being saturated and so for each of these you can define a certain life Span, but this isn't that they died at the end of this lifespan, but they reached the point of commodity or being a commodity. And they reach that point, and then there's a certain element of economic value that changes. There's a certain lack of economic value in the beginning, and there's a certain lack of economic value at the end, especially if you're a company in that space. A better way of putting it is it's very speculative in the beginning, it's typically favoring companies or, or uh, investors who are, who are speculators. In the, in the, in the middle, it's, it's, it's uh, favoring those who are incumbent. And at the end, it's sort of favoring those who integrate and consolidate. And this is, therefore, the lifespan of the industries that made these things. So in fact, you can see that in, in televisions and VCRs and microwaves that the companies that made the early televisions are extinct today, especially in the United States, that they were disrupted by the Japanese, for example, the RCAs and the Zeniths and so on and so on, because they made great money during the time of growth and they were disrupted during the time of saturation. And of course, these are becoming, these are all known as commodities today, even automobiles, although less perhaps as, as, uh, less as, uh, than, than certain other technologies. But this is what it looks like. Now, notice also I've made some interesting, perhaps, pointers here that during periods when we had an economic catastrophe or, or warfare, that actually innovations were not coming out. There is a, a certain pattern to when new things were introduced. And indeed, maybe it had something to do. This is correlation, not causation. Uh, maybe for the Great Depression and World War II, there is definitely some causation because the television could not have been born during that time. Uh, but, but I'm not so sure whether the Vietnam War or the Iraq War really slowed down consumer technologies, but it's something to keep an eye on. Generally speaking, wars are bad for business. And then I thought, okay, let's measure one more thing. And that is, this is, this is, this is the most rich and confusing part, but each of these technologies also has a replacement cycle. So products within each technology get replaced, right? So uh, you would imagine a car would last a certain amount of time, so you would upgrade it. A, a cell phone, a PC, etc., would be upgraded at a certain frequency, right? And this is what we're seeing here in a, in a, in a sort of a, a, a rich pattern. This, for example, is the cell phone, and I'm, I'm saying that it actually ends the upgrade cycle ends and then people begin to buy smartphones approximately here. Um, this, is, this is the PC. The PC, when the early PCs were not very good, people wouldn't keep them for very long. So I'm, I'm assuming they were held for two years and three years and four years and so on and so on. And then here's the, the microwave, that the microwave would last much longer, it being an appliance uh, and so on and so on. So we can make these assumptions about the lifespan of individual products and the reason I do that is because now I can introduce a, let me put it this way, I can go back and know, remember my life, um, it, it starts in 1968, and remember I suggested that, uh, well, this box represents the uh, time when I would be buying stuff. My economic activity span, lifespan. So I expect that when I was a child, I didn't have money to buy stuff. Nowadays, I guess kids do, but I didn't. Um, and I sort of assume that when I got a job, I would have money. And that would probably have been right around when I 
got into college or, or late in high school, and I expect that I'm going to be spending money until I die, although again, that's not a safe assumption in some cases because people tend to spend a lot less when they get older. But if I take this box and then just move it straight down and over this box, make sure I line it correctly, zoom in again, what it covers approximately is what I'm going to buy. And so what's interesting is that if you put a dollar figure on every one of these little segments, knowing how much the first generation of, and second generation, third generation of everything cost, then this is what I'm expected to have spent. And actually, not just expected, I'm almost guaranteed to have spent this money because each of these lines goes to saturation. So that means that almost everybody will have that good. And therefore, this kind of sort of is the minimum amount of spending on technology that I'm, I'm expected to have in everyone born in 1968. And so you can do the same thing for every generation and every, uh, every person born in the last century. In fact, I did that uh, assuming uh, the lifespan of my, my grandmother. And this is what her coverage would have been. And, and this is what she might have spent. Now, actually, she didn't live until here. She actually lived to be 96. So she beat the odds by a great deal. Uh, but uh, that's the way you might analyze uh, different generation and the spending habits over time. Now, the reason I want to point this out is that there's two ways to get spending to go up. One is to make the box wider, and that means having me live longer, or make the box taller, and that again means introducing new technologies. And if that applies to me, then, in the, then it applies to everyone else, and if that means that consumer spending is a function of this technology, innovation, then actually the whole economy is based on it. Actually, consumer spending is the bedrock of the American economy. So then you start to think just how important, because you multiply this by all the people across all of these age bands, and then you get an idea of what the minimum spending is almost guaranteed to be, and then you get an idea of how the minimum size of the economy is going to be. But the story doesn't end there. It's even more perverse. Here's the problem with industries. I want to draw your attention back to the car industry. If you remember, cars were, um, became popular in around 19, eight, uh, 1915. And so what I did is I took the car line there, which took 75 years to, I said, remember, this was the lifespan of an industry. When it began, in 1914, I draw a vertical line, and I draw another vertical line when it reached, uh, uh, it reached its, zen or its, its saturation point. And here are those, those dates, again, 1915 to, 19, uh, to 1990 uh, uh, or so. Now, what I, what I did also is plot on the same scale, or, uh, I mean, on the same axis, x-axis, is a number of firms that actually were created to serve this market. And so this is called auto, uh, the, the, this is actually uh, data from Wikipedia. And it, in some, uh, in total, over 1,000 car companies were created in the United States during this period. So this is entries in blue, exits in orange. Uh, even in 1886, predating the, the 20th century, there was a non-zero number of car companies created in the United States. And these are probably electric or steam powered. And we had a huge uh, burst of activity. Uh, interestingly, 1903 was also when the first airplane was built, mostly because they got the engine technology figured out, which was thank thanks to the auto industry help there. But anyway, this is, this, is the way the, uh, this is the way the birth and death of car companies happen. And of course, now today we bar barely have three, with Tesla maybe four. Uh, but this is, this is the, her the history of um, car company creation. I call that period actually the, the period when the industry was innovating. Innovating not in product, but innovating in business model. Because what happened was, this again is the curve of penetration, and this is the, the, this is the data on production. This is how many cars were built. And you can see how 
penetration and production took off only after the mass extinction of innovators. So what happened? What happened was that Henry Ford figured it out. He figured it out and then, and then essentially put everybody else out of business. Or at least nobody could keep up with the Henry Ford model because it was very capital intensive. It became a game of muscle, not of brain. But that's how things work in industries. And, and that is the scope of time. And note one more thing. Uh, up here, there, the, the scale is for the multiple graphs, but the, the, the scale here is for the production number. So 18 million, keep that in mind. 18 million is the peak auto production. It's starting to come down now. So let's move that aside for a bit. And now I'm going to introduce now the PC industry. Now, the red line again, penetration. This is the PC industry penetration uh, on the same time frame. And here's another graph showing the innovation phase and the mass extinction phase. I'm not using computer companies as a metric. I'm using hard drive companies because computer companies were making all kinds, mini, micro, sometimes mainframes like IBM did. And so it's not an easy uh, number to sort of get a handle on. They did not go out of business necessarily. They simply sold uh, divisions to one another. But hard drive companies were different. There were, there were a certain number of hard drive companies because they were m small hard drives which were PC-centric components and if you measure that you get the same effect. This is the combined total of co companies. Uh, this gray, gray line is the number of companies in, in, uh, in, in the PC uh, hard drive business and, uh, and this is the production numbers globally, not the US only, production numbers in blue. And notice here that the peak is at 400 million versus 18 million, right? So let's, one more, and this is, the, this is the smartphone curve. If you remember, very smooth and straight. Uh, the, the, I don't have the number of firms because again, there's a, some, some odd behavior there. This is the production data. Actually, one billion smartphones actually managed to ship in uh, 2013. So one billion, 400 million, 18 million, order of magnitude higher in terms of output, and it's not done yet, right? Has some ways to go. The point I'm making, though, is notice that not only do you have innovation phase, mass extinctions, you also have um, a compression of the lifespan. You have a compression from 75 years to uh, about 30 years to uh, about uh, a, a decade. And the interesting point, and maybe the thing I want to leave you thinking about is, sorry, um, is whether an individual living and working in these particular eras could have chosen to work in these professions and had a successful and healthy life. Certainly, and this is the prototypical 1960s man who would have entered after the war, baby boomer, would have entered into the workforce into the 1960s and spent their entire career in the auto industry as an engineer, they could have had a very successful, healthy life. And this is kind of what we have in mind as sort of 20th century working man. But the, the generation that would follow, that maybe was born in the 1960s, they would have had a hard time by the time they reached mi middle age namely persons of my age, who would now fi find themselves in difficulty because the chosen profession and the chosen industry would have run out of steam. And massive layoffs will take place. And finally, the question for you is this. You're dealing on a 10-year cycle. You start working in a ten an industry with all full of enthusiasm. You graduate from university. You go into debt in order to solve problems in this world. And then you ask yourself, what happens when it saturates? Actually, I think I'm a bit more optimistic than that. I think actually engineers are the wrong type of people to ask this question of because they are used to having to relearn everything. I'm more, I think the idea of planned obsolescence in technologies is, is well, well understood and accepted and, and it, it doesn't bother you.
But I wonder about the rest of the world because these affect society, as I said. There's a huge impact and in infrastructure cost. And so society has to deal with this. Institutions like education, institutions like government, institutions like finance, and they don't change. They don't improve their cycle times. They don't get faster. The patent system, a reflection of a legal institution that doesn't reform governments which resist reform I mentioned healthcare but it also has a difficult time changing and education is the worst of all it's most important and technology for a century has established those institutions many of them we benefit from either that we benefit like for example education were established in the early part of the 20th century as, as we know them but they aren't reforming now that we're in the 21st and so we're pushing down on the accelerator as hard as we can moving as fast as we can drawing as many lines as we can so that we can get an economy that grows the box for every person uh, but there are some foundations beneath that do not improve, do not change, do not allow that to happen. That's my talk, although I can talk about iTunes if you like. Um, I wanted to kind of try it something else. Would you like to hear about iTunes or we maybe stop and talk about this a bit? All right, a little bit about iTunes as well. Maybe a little bit to be more 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 optimistic um, the thing about iTunes is that it exhibits what we call a logistic curve there it is this is the data that Apple has provided in terms of iTunes subscribers and this is measured in millions so 575 million uh, the last data point we had which was in mid 2013 uh, here's the date you can see it here and uh, I, I, I was so busy this week that I didn't quite yet parse whether, whether uh, Apple's earnings updated this figure. But uh, the trajectory is not likely to change dramatically quarter to quarter, right? This is a very smooth curve. And uh, it's a very hopeful curve. In fact, Android's curve is unknown, but it's likely to be quite steep uh, as well. And this is, you know, they're not the same type of customers, but but it, it's positive and in the right direction. What you have to keep in mind though is of course that nothing goes on forever and these curves that are shaped this way tend to have an S curve to them. So there's a point of inflection. And the question always is where is that point? And what is the cap to this type of thing? Obviously I would argue that it would be you know, the global population but honestly you know, I don't think iTunes can serve uh, seven billion people. It's probably closer to uh, two billion tops. I don't know. I don't know the answer actually. Um, but another thing we can measure is that iTunes is actually, there's published data about how big uh, their revenues are, not just their users, and they're broken out. Actually this data is a little bit of uh, speculation on my part or if you want to be kind, analysis. Um, but this is, roughly speaking, we know something about the, the top of this graph, but we don't know how it's split. But we can get close to it by getting something like uh, the figures that we just saw. Uh, I, I, I didn't post that, actually. No. But uh, the figures on cumulative downloads that let us see how apps are growing. Uh, they give us fragments of this and so on, and we can piece it together. This is a, it's a, pr a pretty safe bet that this is what it looks like. So this is. Uh, as of a few days ago, this is what it, it, this is what it looks like. Um, and that's again the nice shaped curve, right? What, what should draw the attention though is the size of this green area, which is the app gross revenues. Uh, in fact, the better way would be to show it this way. So again, what's it made up of? Software and services, this is actually um, not so much downloads, but uh, Apple's own software, like uh, Pro Tools. It's uh, uh, services like uh, iCloud, 
and iTunes match. Um, that is growing nicely, but nothing quite like that. And it perhaps doesn't belong in this graph, but because Apple puts it all together into iTunes software and services, I have to put it there. The, the, the really interesting media types that we, we should be comparing are, again, apps versus music versus uh, video versus um, books. And of course, iTunes is known as the, uh, as the tunes, the music business. And you can see how music has actually began to go down. And this isn't hypothesis, uh, I mean, th th this isn't just my own guesswork. It's, it's the industry has admitted that, that it, the, the, you know, iTunes is a big chunk of it. And, and the whole industry is coming down. So you can bet iTunes is, is, is a big part of that. But of course, the, the, the big story is, is app revenues. And this is the other way of looking at it in terms of units. And I only chose music, again, because we can get a good handle on it. And back, this graph begins back in 2006, actually end of 2005. And iTunes was an amazing phenomenon back then. It revolutionized music. And if it wasn't for that blue line and we kept the scale to this, it would be a great growth story. But the downloads on apps, it looks to me exactly like that vertical line that we saw in the, uh, in the, in the penetration graphs. It's not penetration exactly, but I would imagine that everyone who has a smartphone is downloading apps. And the number of apps per phone is actually increasing, and it's above 80 at last count. And you can even measure the notion of how many apps per month are being downloaded. So there are all kinds of ways of looking at it, but I think the scariest way, or most exciting, depending on your point of view, is just what it's doing relative to the old media. Remember, this is music. This is rooted in those other lines we saw before, radio and television. By the way, radio eventually evolved into something called the stereo and something called the CD player. I don't know if you remember that. Um, but, but that is that industry, that glorious industry that we saw vertical lines for and who were the disruptors of their day, who disrupted all kinds of previous technology, like, for example, newspapers and movie theaters, and disrupted other forms of live entertainment. And now look at them. They're pathetic. And so this is what I call the appification of the economy. It's affecting these old stalwart industries, which in their day were phenomenal, were exciting and innovative created the consumer electronics industry, created Japan Inc. And apps are killing them. They don't know it yet, though. And many would argue that this is irrelevant because a lot of these apps are free. So what? It's what you, what you care for is consumption. I'm sure when the radio came out, those who were you know, uh, putting on concerts said, that's rubbish poor quality, it was AM only, it really wasn't as good an experience as going to a concert or to the theater. Still true to this day, but so what? It was free, it was commercial, you know, it was supported by commercials, or even had government involvement. Unfair, so what? What matters is that the consumer loves it, and it solves the job to be done. So I'm really excited about apps. It's why I use an app only when I present. Thank you, that's all I have. Hi, thanks. This was a very interesting presentation. Um, I have a question which connects, I guess, both of these slides. So you had that uh, photograph showing that there used to be so many car companies, yeah. but then there's this phase of consolidation, then there were three. And that makes me wonder about consolidation in the business of making apps. Like, yep. if you look around this room, maybe half the people in this room say they're independent. And that makes me kind of think about there being lots and lots of little car companies. Yep. And then if you look, there's like three car companies, maybe mm. four. Yep. And that makes me wonder about, you know, what the future holds for people who make apps and how that's likely to shake up. Yep. And I was wondering if you, with all the data that you keep track of, uh, can sort of think about what numbers you can look at to track that process 
yep. as it unfolds, if it unfolds in the business of apps. For instance, Apple quotes all this money that gets sold through the App Store. How much of that goes to big players like EA yeah, yeah. versus smaller players? Are there numbers for concentration and things like that? What do you believe yeah. the future holds? Yeah, good, good, good question. Actually, I just got the figures. These, these were the ones that were pub uh, spoke that, that Peter Oppenheimer, the CFO of Apple, uh, reported $15 billion uh, in cumulative App Store earnings. Half of them generated uh, in, the, in the last four quarters. Um, and, and so on and so on. I didn't want to dwell too much on those big numbers, but l let me take those, those things in, in one at a time. Um, indeed, there is consolidation that happens. And in fact, I would imagine because we're so far along with the smartphone uh, 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 revolution and we're, we started in 2008 with the App Store, so we're several years into it and it's some, several years into a very steep line and it should have already kind of, we should have had the mass extinction already. I think what's actually being, uh, becoming extinct isn't the independent, but rather the larger firms whose business models were to essentially make uh, apps as factories would. I think what the difference is though, is that this industry is more uh, the, like the entertainment industry where the app makers are the talent. App makers are those who are uh, for example, in radio and in television, they're performers or they're creators or they're, uh, they're the craftsmen who make the thing happen and not so much the distributors or the studios that, that industrialize things. So in many ways, it doesn't mean uh, when you look at those car industry uh, statistics, they're not necessarily comparable to talent-based businesses. Talent-based businesses behave in a much more organic way, much more potentially uh, self-sustaining ways. Actually, one of the great things about Hollywood, which I learned by, by, by you know, simply being a, a, a writer and publisher uh, and, and uh, uh, podcaster, people tell me lots of things. And one of the things I learned about Hollywood is how resilient it is, even in face of so much disruption that it has suffered from going from, as we know, you know film cameras to uh, uh, VCR to DVDs to an uh, online distribution, the talent pool has not been all that affected. In fact, the talent pool uh, is as vibrant as ever and as attractive as ever, and now many of them are actually trying to hop into new ways of creating things because the tools are available. So, in fact, the, what makes Hollywood resilient is because it broke apart from being a studio system long ago, and so essentially it's, the, it's people getting together on project basis, building stuff like a movie, and then sort of breaking up again, and then form, reforming, and so on and so on. So it's not a very much an industry in that sense. Hollywood is very much a, uh, a, a, a community. So it's important to think, I think, of yourselves and app developers as uh, artisans as artists who are able to, because of the way they configure and reconfigure themselves, are able to withstand the, the uh, disruptive forces uh, that, you know, uh, prey upon the, the, the rigid and inflexible. I think to follow up, a couple of missing things are the number of books written and the number of albums created because it feels to me that we're more on that scale than on the scale of exactly. film production. I don't think literacy is decreasing even in the age of the internet, meaning how much people read. Uh, if you think about newspapers being disrupted, that doesn't mean that people who write news are de decreasing. If anything, it's exploding. It's just happening online. Uh, you know, a journalist could probably make a go and make a better living uh, if they're good uh, on their own rather than being in a newsroom. On and on it goes. I think talent, talent is actually being unleashed in much more powerful ways today than it ever was. So I think that the, the collapse of the innovators seems misleading when we have the collapse of innovators in the auto industry versus apps. The cost of an app is dramatically less than exactly. a car ever the economics. The economics may feel painful to, to many, but especially to those who depend upon high cost structures. And I think that, again, don't forget that we're, we are building on the shoulders of giants. We're building on the shoulders of the internet. We're building on the shoulders of, of high-speed broadband, which makes a, this distribution of talent, this distribution of effort much more effective. It used to be in the 1990s, if you had to start a software company, you needed $30 million, a sales force, who could go out there and literally door-to-door -door sell software. 
And that's no longer the case. You have distribution built into the internet, essentially. And you have distributed uh, ways of building stuff. You didn't have to have your own computers in your own rooms and so on and so on. It's just incredible, the productivity improvement of creativity itself. And so that's a very positive message. I think that's reflected in this data, yeah. I would also just point out, I didn't see Moore's Law in your discussion and the semiconductor industry, and that's been well, be very important for us. There are too many laws to cite. There's the, the problem is that that law applies to computers, but what would be the law that applied to automobiles? Well, I would argue that it was you know, Ford's law, the ability to crank production, which actually allowed not, not just the cars to be built in the millions, but it allowed airplanes to be built in the hundreds of thousands, which helped or, or, or you know, fought wars with and so on and so on. Industry was, was scaling at a tremendous rate in the 20th century. Or the, what would law would be in effect to make the phone network possible or the electricity network possible? Uh, certainly, I think Moore's law is on order of magnitude more powerful than any of those other laws, and that has allowed this sort of you know, exponential growth. Some would suggest that if it keeps going, we'll have this singularity so that my graphs are going to be thrown away in about 20 years because because we're gonna, not going to worry about them anymore or something. I don't know. I don't. Uh, the other thing that might seem a little weird to me is that, you know, apps are such a, it's such a generic term. When you talked about uh, video game consoles, well, video game consoles now, we have them all in our pockets. So those mm -hmm. are apps, you know? So it's not that video games as the software were dying, yeah. it's the consoles died, but that's because we now yeah, have yeah, that yeah, inside of, of our phone. And, uh, you know, and just in terms of thinking what might be the threats to this, I mean, apps are such a, it's such a broad category. Um, you know, we might have a particular skill set that could be decimated by a rise of Android or another particular, that we mm. might still make apps though, you know? So yeah, I don't, yeah. it just seems like a very broad category mm. that you can easily say is growing, but there's a lot of shakeup that could happen inside of that, you know? Of course, I'm smoothing a lot of data out to make the, even, even the, the big technologies, uh, many would argue in the consumer space that, you know, you can't put radio like this because it evolved so, in so many ways over that time span. And cars to suggest that a Henry Ford uh, Model T versus a modern car are comparable is ludicrous. But things do change, but we have to have a frame of reference, and that's, that's what I'm put, putting forward here. Sure, and, and I mean, for instance, like you mentioned with cars, like in the next few years, we'll be making apps for cars, if not this year or yeah. next year. The so I call it just generally speaking the appification. W one way to think about smart devices is to actually d define the device in terms of the app. And here's what I mean. We have microprocessors embedded in that many, many objects already today. We have, we have dozens of microprocessors in our cars. We have microprocessors in our homes and various appliances. But we don't think yet of the Internet of Things or, or smart, uh, uh, you know, the fabric of smart devices. Why? Because those microprocessors are not addressable by apps. I consider a smart device to be only three things. Number one, a microprocessor. Number two, an API or a way to address that microprocessor with, by a third party. And three, a connection to the internet. Now, if those three things are present even into a basic device, like a, uh, you know, something like a shoe, then to me that's a smart device. And if, so therefore the, the definition of the device is dependent on the definition of the app. And that's really going to be, I think, the revolution. Maybe the lines that will be drawn will be very hard to point out exactly what the device is because it's really apps that are one of the lines in their own right. Yes. I'm curious why you chose the uh, number of units downloaded and purchased rather than the dollar volume. Well, I had both, actually. The previous chart um, had, had dollar values. This is gross revenues. So it's actually even more dramatic. The interesting thing that happened, by the way, um, so what happened here, suddenly there's like an acceleration vertically that's in that purchase. In that purchase is the untold hero of 2013. Because, you know, literally Q113, I had to recalculate everything because it didn't make sense anymore. We were getting revenue numbers and, and, and downloads that were not, uh, were not tracking in parallel anymore. Suddenly, I had to change the ASP, or average selling price, of an app. It used to be like 19 cents, meaning what did I do? I took all the known do download totals, right, 
every, every time they were given. And I took the, the, the total revenue and I would say, okay, then since the beginning of time, all the apps sold were sold on an average for let's say 19 cents. And so all free and paid apps together averaged 19 cents. And that number actually started to grow. And I don't think so much the price of the purchase and the, the meaning of the download price was, you know, was obsoleted. So in that purchase, now be careful, of course, it may be that only a couple of players are making all the money. We don't know the distribution. We don't know how flat or how, how uh, skewed this, this, this data is. But clearly something happened in, the, in that purchase. So and just to probe yeah. that, you, you're saying you don't know the breakdown of revenue in in-app purchases? I think we'd all love to know No, I don't. I think there are some firms which try to, try to obtain that data and sell it. I don't cite anything that, that, is, uh, that has, uh, you know, a price on it because in the, I, 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 you know, there are terms and conditions I'm not aware of and so on. But there's a company, for example, Distimo, who, and there are others who I think also try to measure this in that purchase value. What I'm saying is I don't know if it's 10 companies making all the money and nobody else. I don't know how to measure that yet. But overall, this, this is a, an amazing, amazing change. Um, right here. Yeah. Um, really enjoyed seeing the, the, when, where the, 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 the slide where you were showing the shelf life of those objects, basically the refresh cycle. Uh, so you, you were showing that, you know, uh, dishwashers and, and then the cell phones and the smartphones were two years each. Um, I'd be very curious sort of going forward in um, finding out how apps compare to other, the shelf life of apps. Good question, yeah. Um, compared to other kinds of media like movies or, or uh, soundtracks because, you know, some, there's that curve of popularity and then they drop off and apps are, you know, but, uh, feel the same any, way. Yeah, as any... Uh, object of, of sort of creative, creative uh, thought, it's hard to generalize it. There's so many ways we can imagine things. Uh, so to your point, uh, like, okay, what is the lifespan or shelf life of a newspaper? Typically one day. Um, news nowadays is, is almost like online news is probably has a shelf life of, of hours, even minutes before, you know, how long does a Twitter stream get, how, how long are you willing to scroll back in your, in your stream is the answer. So in that sense, uh, we're seeing a contraction even of what is non-executable uh, non, non code. Uh, but the, the, the idea that, that you can create something that uh, nowadays because it's in your pocket and your pocket is a volatile place, that your pocket is um, a device which won't have a long span of life, but at, at the same time you can uh, you can you know transfer your your content from from phone to phone, and also I think music has somewhat had a more uh, resilience than 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 I would have thought. I think people are still holding on to uh, to music libraries, even probably more now that they're digital than they used to when they were CDs or even before then tapes because they were obsoleting the, the medium, the, the media file, uh, or the media uh, storage uh, containers and so on. Who knows, I don't have an answer. It depends a lot on, on, on the different types of, of things you create. If you create a killer app, uh, meaning uh, a game, uh, you know, it might last for, for decades. Mario Brothers, you know, franchises. You just refresh them and keep them going. If you create something that has a very very short term, kind of like mom at the moment, then, then maybe, maybe not. But there's nothing wrong with it, I suppose. Yes? So uh, as you're showing the adoptions of various technologies, this, this one thing stuck with me. How did radio reach 100% before electricity did? That's a very good point. Um, the difference isn't great, uh, but I think the answer is that there were radios powered by batteries and I actually know because in my family, we have a cottage over on an island in the middle of a lake. And in that cottage, they didn't throw stuff away. We have still radios from the 1940s. Uh, and, and there's a radio there, battery powered, you know, a big console radio. And I looked at the battery and it's like a six volt battery, something unusual today. 
But these were things that you would go to the drugstore and purchase once a month. And these radios did consume a lot of power because, again, they're not 100-watt subwoofers on them. And uh, they were just AM radios, sometimes even shortwave radios. Vacuum tube, yes. But again, the earliest ones were really low-powered. And they, they also had, uh, well, I'm not going to quibble. I think a good, that's a good discussion for research. I think someone could probably dig up a large number of these radios that were battery-powered. Don't forget, a lot of country homes or, or, or farms they were last to get on the electricity grid, just like today they're the last to get bandwidth. And, and they, they had to deal, they had to get on radio. It was, it was, you could not be on it. It was just such a phenomenal success. Yeah. Um, slightly more uh, mundane question about apps. What app do you use to create your presentation and display it? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's called Perspective. It's, uh, it's an app built actually by Varshad and Sanat Hor. There are, oh, back there helped me out with, uh, with it quite a bit in, 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 in getting going. Uh, it's, it's available in the App Store. It's a fan fantastic. Uh, um, feel free to get in touch later. We can point you in the right direction. It's just called Perspective. Search for it if you want to try it out. Hello. Um, I just wanted to comment that obviously these are only revenues that are flowing through Apple. Yes. And there's a lot of revenues associated with apps, like shopping and other stuff, that does not flow through Apple. Yep. Um, and so it's, al it's also very interesting to think about um, smartphones and tablets as being um, ubiquitous infrastructure out in the society now mm -hmm. that uh, we can all take advantage of. Well, indeed, this is only a proxy. This is, uh, even the, the graphs you saw where the United States is a pra proxy for the world. It's only 4% of the population of the world, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I think this is maybe, I don't know, in terms of value, maybe over half of the value created in, uh, by apps in this, in this sense. But there are, of course, many other apps. And I think what we'll see, in fact, is if these CPUs are addressable in the future, it may not be the traditional smartphone vendors. There might be new entrants coming in with mobile devices or, or some kind of infrastructure. I mean, why not? Uh, I suppose they, even the notion of Android, the notion of the, who owns that uh, addressable uh, uh, you know, a, a, a CPU, is, is it becomes less and less relevant. Um, I suspect we'll see these types of lines drawn for apps coming from you know, uh, embedded or nearly embedded technology like automobiles today. And we're going to get, make, make things which are not smart smart. And, and, uh, and so iTunes may end up being, again, a small percent of the total uh, revenue out there for app builders. Uh, just like the Mac, uh, which and the Apple II were minorities uh, eventually in, in their in their industries. Um, so, um, so just to follow up, that one spike from app uh, in app purchases yeah. is think of it as a business model innovation that happens to be within the Apple ecosystem. So, just you know, thinking forward about all the other innovations that and business models that are possible because of all these smart devices? Business model innovation is always the biggest disruption, right? It's not technological innovation as much. At least if there's a technological innovation, unless it's put together with a business model innovation, it just doesn't go anywhere. And, you know, there are many technologies, for example, on this list, which were not put there. Like, what about, for example, camcorders? What about digital cameras? What about pagers? Well, I did put them on there for a couple of reasons. One, there's no data. Two, they probably did reach 100%, and they probably, whatever they got to, they kind of started coming down already. But uh, to your point, I think the business model innovation in apps is yet to come. There's a lot of opportunity out there in terms of figuring out. Like, take, for example, you know, I'm wearing this wrist thing, this, this Nike Plus. Um, it, what's its business model? It's an app that actually enables the technology the app is sitting where? It's actually sitting on my phone. Uh, I download it from the App Store. They get no revenue for it. I end up paying Nike, who's a shoe company or whatever company, for a thing that makes me feel good about the fact that I didn't go to the gym today. You know? So, because I'm waving my arms a lot. So, uh, 
So the idea is that there's a business model for someone who devised an app, maybe they were acquired, maybe they built it in-house, but there is a developer behind this whole thing and they're monetizing it in a very, very creative way uh, and finding a job to be done and finding a way to attach value to that job, et cetera, et cetera. So I think wearables, I mean, it might come to the point where app developers will start developing hardware simply as a means of attaching value to their idea. And it might be possible through the capital structures, maybe because Bitcoin will become exciting and you'll be able to crowdsource stuff that you couldn't before. And finally, we'll disrupt these financial institutions that stand in the way of allocating resources, right? And it's, it's, it's because, not because they're stupid, but because there's frictions and inefficiencies built into the system. And in fact, Bitcoin is an app. And Bitcoin in that sense might enable a lot more innovation in apps themselves. So I'm very hopeful, in fact, that these lines will be drawn, but we may not recognize them in the context of this grid. So mortgage-backed securities are kind of an app, too. And, um, well, it, it's kind of, you can say, yeah, all kinds of fraud is apps, too, right? So uh, it's an algorithm at the end, but they, there hasn't been innovation in financial services since the ATM. Well, I think what I'm saying more generally is that there are things that seem like a good idea at the time, and then we have consequences that yeah. happen because of them. And a couple of things that I, one thing I saw mentioned was that your charts reminded someone of climate change and global warming. Oh. And another point that I noticed wasn't mentioned is population. So these are like macro factors that yeah. are part of predicting the future. And right. I, so I like what I, you're I, saying I, about. I didn't have enough know. layers um, that I could yeah. put on for all of that. But indeed, if I could, I should, because what we'd imagine is that each of those lines, you saw that I should have stacked them up in the Z direction, Z dimension of sort of how many people were born in that year. And then we would have a three-dimensional graph and we could study, uh, you know, in terms of that, that's, that rectangle that I drew for my life should, should have been a, uh, a, a you know, a, a three-dimensional box into which all the people of my generation would have fit. Now, there are these data points, and in, in, indeed, I think you need to also, if, you, if you're thoughtful about this, this type of stuff, you should be looking at work from, exa for, for, from uh, for example, uh, Hans Rosling and the future of population growth, and that what that's going to do to resources. It's actually a pretty hopeful story, although his time frame goes to 2100, about 30 years later than mine, but ultimately it's, it becomes a good story by then, which is, Again, only a couple of generations from now. It's not that far ahead. Hi, uh, wonderful uh, bit of data analysis there. Uh, I love the historical perspective. It reminds me of a book I read comparing the uh, uh, growth of the telegraph industry with the growth of the internet, how a lot of the same things were said about mm -hmm. both. Uh, one of the things about those earlier industries is they not only had consumers, and you plotted a lot of data about the consumers of technology, but they also involved the population as part of the producers, the infrastructure, the distribution. In other words, there used to be a lot of telegraph operators. There used to be a lot of telephone operators in your uh, bit on the condensation of the, of the auto industry, even though the auto industry consolidated down to a few firms for several decades, the growth of workers involved in manufacturing, servicing, distribution, mm -hmm. uh, the number of people involved, for instance, in, uh, there used to be several uh, uh, VCR, sh uh, VCR tape shops near me that no longer exist, uh, uh, record stores that no longer exist. What do you see in the curve of people involved in the total ecosystem yeah. of apps yeah. versus just the number of companies? Well, I alluded to that shortly, that indeed there's an impact on those who are less skilled and less less fortunate uh, because they tended to be employable before by these industries and that allowed society to benefit in a more equal way. Um, the, the, uh, there are both positives and negatives. Obviously we can't expect that those who were servicing uh, 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 horses before cars that they should somehow be, be uh, taken care of in, in sort of they should be retrained. Maybe that did happen. But the, the struggle here is that you, you do want to create value beyond the very, very few, right? And the question is how to make it happen. Um, 
I, I, I think part of it is also the flexibility of the workforce. One of the things I study separately is whether what, the, what happened in the United States during 1940s in the, in the mobilization for war allowed, uh, you know, for example, women to work that could, didn't work before. And that type of mobilization is something China today is able to do. And the U.S. can no longer do that. And there's, there's loss, loss of flexibility. So to some degree, that's in itself a way of the society getting disrupted overall because we've lost our ability to really uh, adapt and, and suffer even in doing so. I don't have the answers, I'm afraid. That's a little bit beyond my pay grade. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's a great question and something I love to talk about. So let's take one more question. Yeah. I understand that your data was really based upon more of a US-centric perspective. Yeah. Clearly, we are going more into worldwide markets, but the U.S., as you said, 4%, but still driving most of the economics. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a change with the innovators, though, the people who are creating the technology? Because I really didn't see anything in that in your chart about worldwide. It's a great worldwide. question. I think today we're seeing, uh, at, at the level of apps and developers and talent, I think talent is uniformly distributed globally. That means that there's 4% of the talent where 4% of the people live. There's nothing untalented about other people in other parts of the world. Uh, and by talent, I also mean intelligence or any other attributes that we think of as, as skill. Um, the difference is typically the systems available to unleash those talents. Uh, ultimately, historically, there you know countries which were free or so-called had certain freedoms were unleashing more talent. Uh, there, I think globally we're going to see an improvement and again the proxy for, for that will be uh, the fact that there are more, more democracies in the world, that there's less war in the world, that there is, there is more access to resources and so on. And again, Hans Rosling is a better authority on any of this, so I'm sure hundreds of other people too. Uh, but as far as technology adoption curves, again, I went back even before the 19th century and look at the curves for railroads and canals and ship, ship, shipping by, by sea and air transport and road networks. And no matter which country uh, started the, uh, the revolution, for example, England starting with railroads, everybody copied them eventually and, uh, and at the same speed, the saturation occurred at the same speed. So even countries which are completely broken like the Soviet Union due to civil war and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, totalitarian regimes eventually got railroads working, eventually got roads. Uh, and, and so there, there is this, this somehow this like universal, universal value in this, some of this stuff that everybody wants to have eventually. And same thing happened with cell phones and, and computers. So yeah, the world is getting smaller and, and, uh, and, and more, more, more opportunities is spreading around it. But uh, it sometimes takes much longer than you expect. Thank you. Thank you.